All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us at the Air Sensors International Conference Virtual Summer Series. Um, we are excited to share some great presentations that were meant to be at the in-person conference that would have started yesterday in Pasadena, um, but was postponed due to COVID. We're excited to share some presentations from that conference with you all here virtually. Um, if you are able to introduce yourself into the chat box with your name, organization, and location, that would be greatly appreciated so that we can see who here is uh, attending with us. Um, this uh, this uh, virtual session is being hosted by the UC Davis Air Quality Research Center. My name is Sandra Hall. I am the coordinator behind the scenes. I would like to introduce you to our moderators for the day, Calvin Cabini from Clean Air Carolina and Ethan McMahon from US EPA. I am going to review a couple housekeeping items. Everybody here is in listen only mode. Um, when we get to the question and answer session, if you could please type any questions you have for the present presenters in the Q&A box or in the chat, um, that would be greatly appreciated. You are also able to upvote questions in the Q&A box if you have the same question and would like to make sure that that question is answered. Um, if you're having any trouble with the stream or with any of the technology, please type in your questions or issues into the chat box and one of the moderators or myself will uh, help you out. I also want to let you know that this meeting is being recorded um, and then once the uh, session is complete, we will be sharing this recording on the website along with any questions that were not able to be answered live. So without further ado, I am going to hand off control to Calvin as the first moderator. Thank you very much, Sandra. I'm super excited to get started, especially as I see a lot of really, really great um, folks that I've met at previous conferences in the chat already. Um, I'd like to introduce first um, Graham Carvlin. If I can get the slide to move forward one here. Um, who is of the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency. Um, he's an air resource specialist there. He has a PhD in environmental health from the University of Washington and an MS in chemistry from UC San Diego. Graham works with the intersection of air sensors and community science, and currently he's developing web tools to help make the public sense of their sensor data. All right, take it away, Graham. Hello everybody, I'm Graham Carvlin. Today I'll be presenting on web tools that I've developed for the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency where I'm an air resources specialist. So we have a list of web tools here as well as the sensor lending program where we hand out sensors to the public. We've also got the air sensor dashboard which has a number of tools including the purple air downloader, community reporter, the sensor map, which is kind of standalone, kind of a part of the dashboard, and uh, just an internal tool to connect to AWS and help um, work with these shiny apps. So for the sensor lending program, we have been lending out monitors to community groups and individuals, including the Dylos, Purple Air, and Air Beams. And uh, our program's been running for about a year, year and a half now. And we've had a number of people request sensors. And uh, I would say there's about a quarter of them who are interested in air pollution, an air pollution source near them. And a lot of that here in our area is wood smoke related. And then we've got maybe two thirds that 
are interested in using these sensors as educational tools. A number of people who borrow them for their kids to teach them about air quality. We even had some kids um, take them to their uh, school science fair and they won the science fair by presenting about, you know, their walk around their neighborhood with the Dylos. So that was exciting to see. Um, when people apply for the uh, sensor loan, they fill out a quick questionnaire to get an idea of what their interests are, what their question is. And, you know, that's really kind of the starting point. We contact them after that and usually have a phone call or, or a chat over email and just try and kind of get a feel for what they're trying to learn by using the sensor. And sometimes just in that conversation, we find out that there are existing resources that can help them um, maybe uh, another agency or a fire department that's able to help them with, let's say, like an outdoor burning complaint. And sometimes um, sensors are the right tool. And then we ship them the sensors and uh, with some information on how to operate them, how to analyze the data, and how to think about the use of a sensor is kind of like a mini scientific study. So the air sensor dashboard has a uh, three tools currently, which are a map, the sensor map, a download tool for purple air data, and a reporting tool. This is the purple air downloader. You can select sites to download using the map on the left with a rectangle or polygon selection, or you can search by ID or name. And what this tool allows you to do is you select a date range, and then you can average the data from minute to hour to day, apply a 75% data completeness, and then check the boxes for QC filtering or calibration, which we'll talk about uh, during the sensor map section, and change the output uh, time zone as well. And you can have different start and end dates for different sets of monitors. The output of this is a single Excel ready CSV what that means is you could just open it up in Excel and start making graphs or analyze it in your favorite analysis program. Then we have the community reporter, which is a tool that is used in conjunction with our sensor lending program. So it supports the sensors that we lend out and the public can take the sensors, record information, and then upload it to the community reporter, which crunches the numbers and gives them back this PDF output with some graphs of what those sensors said. To upload the data, you select one or multiple files, and then you can, within those files, select the chunk of data that you're interested in, which is a process called labeling. And so you can select on a map or on this time series and basically tag the information that you're interested in. So you could compare one area to another or one point in time to another point in time. Once you've labeled the data, you can calibrate it to the nearest reference site. Then you can um, create a hypothesis. So we try and um, have people thinking about their use of these sensors to answer their question in at least a semi-scientific way. You know, I have this concern about um, wood smoke, you know, and during the nighttime. So I, my hypothesis is that my purple air is going to be highest at night. Or I think that this one area in my neighborhood has higher concentrations than the other because I see a lot of diesel trucks idling there. So I'm going to walk around my neighborhood I'm going to label that area, and then I'm going to label the background, and then I'm going to compare those two. So that's what the hypothesis section is for. Once you have clicked the Analyze Data button, the da uh, Download Data and Download Report buttons pop up, and you can get that Excel-ready file with the process data and also the PDF report. The report has a background info section that uh, users are able to fill out, and uh, along with some summary statistics, Calibration, if there was a calibration applied, a time series, a map, a graph of the hour of day with some text along with those. And then an analysis of the hypotheses. So here, 
we hypothesized that Capitol Hill PM 2.5 was highest in the afternoon. However, it was actually highest at night. So you have the, the results of those tests there. This is an image of our sensor map, which combines regulatory sites, which are the stars, with QC and calibrated purple air data, and those are the circles. There are about 10 times as many purple airs in our area as there are regulatory sites, and so this adds a lot of spatial information. It also adds a lot of temporal information because the purple airs report one minute data, whereas the regulatory sites are reporting hourly data. And when you're looking at this map as a health view that we're seeing here, you're getting a 24 hour estimate. So that, this is, the purpose of this is to compare the different sites with a focus on air quality and health. If you look at the instant view, you see just the purple airs, just the one minute data. And the advantage of that view is seeing air quality change rapidly during an air pollution event, such as a wildfire. And with this enhanced spatial information, we can see it come into our area and leave our area basically as it happens. Whereas the reference sites are at about a two hour lag, it takes them an hour to record the information and then to report it, it takes about another hour as well. And this is how the data processing works in the background. First, you drop the hours where both sensors don't have any data. Then you remove values that are either too high or too low. Too low is if the total particle count is less than 10. And this is listed in the 0 0.3 micrometer size bin, which is the count of all particles greater than that diameter. And you would never really expect that to be zero, not even in a clean indoor environment. The high cutoff is greater than 1,000 micrograms per meter cubed. And you might say that, well, there are some instances where you'll see values higher than that, and that's true. And if you're concerned about this, I would suggest setting it to 3,000 because there are some known error states above 3,000. And at least in our area, 90% of the values above 1,000 are above 3,000, indicating that error state. Then we compare the two sensors within the purple layer monitor to each other. And we flag them if they haven't agreed well over the past three days, or if they're not agreeing well for that hour. And the three-day test is using lens concordance, which is kind of like an R-squared, but it also, also measures the distance to the one-to-one -one line. And what that gets us uh, thinking about is signal attenuation. And if one sensor is reading lower than another sensor or vice versa. Uh, if they're not reading well for that hour, then clearly there's a more serious break between the two sensors. This represents about 5% of the data. Then we compare sensors between different monitors. And if the sensors are a certain amount below or above the median of all nearby sensors, then they're flagged. Nearby here is calculating using a semivariogram, which is a measure of difference by distance. And so it tries to get at what sites might be experiencing similar conditions now for that hour. About 3% of data is flagged for this. And if you're just looking at that data, that 5% where the comparison between the sensors doesn't have an answer, about 30% of that is flagged and the rest of it is okay. Then we calibrate either to a nearby site if that calibration equation has an R squared greater than 0.5 or to the EPA national background about two thirds of the time. So here are two error states that you'll see with the purple air sensors. There's a sudden failure mode. And you can see on the y-axis, this is jumping up to about 3,300. So that's why I was suggesting 3,000 is also a decent cutoff point. Because you'll see this. And the comparison between the two sensors in the monitor, that will tell you that this is happening. And because it's that high, you know which one's wrong. But what about all the time before it jumped up that high and after it jumped up that high? The information and the flagging of that one sensor that it turns out has actually been performing poorly the whole time is 
primarily done by the intermonitor QC and knowing what the monitors around it are, is saying. Then you have sensor attenuation where the yellow highlighted sensor on this bottom graph is reading much lower than the other sensor. Now you might look at this graph and say, oh, well, you know, it's only reading five micrograms per meter cubed max, so clearly that's wrong. But this is just one example of many examples I've seen. And some of them I've done my best just to guess personally by looking at it, and you really can't tell. So having that comparison between the monitors does provide valuable information. Finally, I'd like to present this uh, little tool that is basically just a management tool. It helps me manage all these different apps. You can turn them on, turn them off, reboot them, add a new app, update an app, etc. without having to go through a lot of either manual work or scripting in Linux on the Amazon Web Services server, AWS server. This just allows you to press a button, turn it on, turn it off, update it, etc. It's an R Studio add-on, so you know these shiny apps are built in R. Uh, if you uh, install this package, then you can get this add-on. And after you set up your Amazon Web Services account, which is pretty simple, you provision an EC2 instance, you could get started pretty much right away, creating a new app and you know updating it, etc. So the next steps here are to do some user testing of the tools in the air sensor dashboard, um, particularly the community reporter, which we're trying to get some interest in that and some testing. And then just a note here that the tools can be scaled to larger geographies. It's not within the purview of our agency to do that, but if someone were interested in that, you know, these run on load balanced auto scaling groups. That basically means that the more people that come to them, the bigger the server um, grows. And, you know, with some optimization tweaks, you could get that to run nationwide or worldwide. So thank you. And I would love to take any questions during the Q&A. And definitely feel free to reach out. Thank you very much, Graham. Um, that was an enlightening presentation. I saw some really great tools. Uh, next up, I would like to introduce Angela Eaton. She's the director of SafeCast and leads the air quality and radiation monitoring efforts in the US. She supports communities looking to engage in environmental monitoring throughout the Americas. Angela is currently working with the Los Angeles Public Library on their efforts to build citizen science communities at branches and seeks new ways to encourage environmental monitoring as a means to satisfy the curious and empower communities. To this, she brings previous experience in sustainable system design in urban water infrastructure and has consulted nonprofits, utilities, and cities in conservation and greenhouse gas reduction. Angela has served as a South by Southwest Eco Advisory Board member, that's pretty cool, and has participated as a civil society working group reviewer during the United Nations Habitat process in which the current sustainable development goals were established. I'm looking forward to your presentation, Angela. Hi, I'm Angela Eaton, America's Director for SafeCast. I'm here to speak with you today about our experiences building trust through the development of community data assets at public institutions. We'll discuss this in three parts. In part one, we'll talk about SafeCast's organizing principles as methods of creating community trust and increasing civic engagement. Part two, we'll discuss some of SafeCast's current work with public institutions and how we're managing during the COVID-19 shelter in place orders. Part three is a single slide listing some references and credits along with places where the discussion goes deeper. What am I talking about with community or publicly held data assets? With air quality, people tend to know what their experiences are. Quantifying those experiences allows communities to discuss those realities productively with government, industry, and as a group. So we ask the groups we work with, what questions do you have that environmental data can answer? And how can you take action from the data? 
Being responsive to needs rather than anticipating them is what we call pull over push. In a traditional sense, pull technologies respond to customer demand and push technologies try to develop ideas before there's a need. SafeCast is a pull organization in that it's a collection of individuals responding directly to needs as they arise. We find that it's an important aspect of community-driven design. It's also an efficient way of organizing volunteers who jump into projects they're interested in. Volunteers train each other on how to do observations on their data. Non-technical participants take part in monitor development by hosting, maintaining, and providing feedback on monitors. It's important that no one person controls the SafeCast effort. It's an organization built on rough consensus. Now I'm going to look at the community experience of open environmental data collection. Here are some reasons people have given for contributing to SafeCast and other open data projects. Fairness. People want to know, how will I know what nor what's normal and what's out of bounds if I don't have a way to compare? Inclusion. Is my experience really represented? Trust. How do I know if the data that's currently being collected by other organizations is accurate? There are also real obstacles to community science. An important issue for air quality monitoring is that communities have been burned by pseudo participation. This happens when we're given the impression that we can affect change just by putting up a monitor, but we're locked out of the real empowerment of being able to reconfigure our roles with regards to digital services that we engage with. Pseudo participation by design hurts the overall willingness to participate in projects or trust in government. In this case, full participation includes being the author of data rather than a subject of data collection. In other words, top-down closed organizations result in lost trust. The power of community science, both for communities and institutions, is that it builds trust from no trust. And how do publicly held assets establish trust? Government data, commercially collected data, data collected for academic research and industry mandated data collection serve very specific purposes and are not 100% aligned with my or my community's needs. Although each type of data collector can serve an important role in our understanding of air quality, all data can be improved if there's transparency and standardization that allows that data to be used universally. On the left, we have a representation of top-down, closed, push-style organization where monitoring happens to what extent or what data i get to see and freely use means that i have to rely on a provider for environmental data that i may need add proprietary algorithms and lack of standardization to the mix and i may not be able to compare data between organizations even if i do have access on the right the first order of trust is for data that i collect myself Within my community, I may not know the people or the motivations of any individual doing air quality monitoring, but I do trust the data submitted by my monitor. Everyone who's opted in is determining the granularity of the data being gathered for my area. Other monitors are also reading particulate matter, and I can check the raw data files from their monitors. Trust isn't needed between community members because we're all participating willingly using the same ground rules and we have all we all have access to raw data from the entire data set. But it also does something else. If we all have equal access to standardized transparently collected raw open data, we can begin to have a conversation. Open data can also be used to verify other data sets, increasing the value of each. What's important to remember is that at any time, we may lose access to any data set that is not in the public domain. Sadly, government data, which has been dutifully collected for years, can be removed from the public view in the, in the change of an administration. Creative Commons Zero, or CCO, is a copyright designation that enables scientists, educators, artists, and other creators and owners of copyright or database protected content to waive their works, placing them as completely as possible in the public domain. 
Although we appreciate attributions to SafeCast as a public data set, the CCO designation allows others to freely build upon, enhance and reuse the works for any purposes without restriction under copyright or database law. As everything is posted to the SafeCast SafeCast platform resides in the public domain with no rights reserved, the air quality data submitted to the platform can be aggregated into larger data projects free from attribution to every participant. This is by design. For instance, if each person with each sensor had to be attributed and our data got rolled up into massive analysis of all historical sensor data to find megatrends, it would be impossible to provide attribution to every single provider of data. Open data is essential to allow people to write software that uses that data freely and combine it with other data. SafeCast uses its influence to increase open data participation that, and calls for the release of closed data sets. Because SafeCast data exists in the public domain, there's less reason to keep similar data private. It's important to be understandable, and it's important for that understanding to extend to how data is processed and derived. The SafeCast platform displays raw, unprocessed data directly from the sensors. People are free to download all data on the SafeCast platform and can either work with the raw data or use it as the basis for other calculations, which we think should be standardized and stated up front. Once the data is uploaded onto the SafeCast platform, it cannot be changed or removed. Based on growing public desire for participatory air quality monitoring, SafeCast volunteers began talking about how to add particulate matter readings to the SafeCast platform. After four years of prototyping, the result was the SolarCast. With funding from the Annenberg and Shuttleworth Foundations, 20 SafeCast volunteers hosted sensors in Los Angeles. SolarCast monitors were also used to monitor air quality at a Ciclavia event and around, around the Santa Susana nuclear facility during the 2018 Woolsey fire, when people were interested in both smoke and possible radiation contamination. Some solar cast monitors are still in use, live information is mapped, and older inf information can be downloaded. December 2019, SafeCast volunteers launched the AirNote monitor. Our first monitors will be used to support citizen science at the Los Angeles Public Library. Libraries are public spaces and also trusted information and collaboration centers. LAPL has a goal of serving all neighborhoods equally. However, poor neighborhoods make use of the library services to a much greater degree than affluent ones. LAPL reports that 32% of library patients, patrons do not have connectivity outside of the library. By creating and supporting programs, LAPL is not only providing a necessary service, it's increasing civic public participation and trust within the branch communities. This pilot program will take place at 23 branches in Los Angeles and Pasadena. SafeCast will train librarians in how to support or create environmental monitoring groups that could range from existing local clubs to after school classes where students can examine questions and learn about environmental data coming from their monitors and monitors at other locations. SafeCast plans to support librarians, both as community members and as representatives of public institutions, with the following goals in mind. We hope to research how air, open source air quality data may change the personal choices that individuals make to affect climate change. We hope to promote neighborhood science that empowers individuals and communities in their personal health decision making. We hope to research the effect of open source data collection and environmental data use with regards to individuals and communities' abilities to access public services and interact with local governments. And we hope to further develop a comprehensive data set showing the trends in Los Angeles air quality by neighborhood. Our position is that when collecting and making sense of this information becomes integrated into the ecosystem of a trusted, unbiased neighborhood resource, it gives people the tools they need to increase their understanding of and involvement with the quality of their environment. Using library sites as relay points, environmental sensors will be permanently placed all over the city, sending back data regularly to the library and library members. This is a crucial part of the plan to build community 
increase local knowledge, and amplify local leaders' voices. Libraries are uniquely suited to share, promote discussion, and, and uh, provide analysis for air quality data. By recognizing the emotional and social components of looking at data as a community, librarians are speaking to the core motivations of participating based on personal and community achievement. So how's it been going? COVID-19. This is when community trust in public institutions is most tested. Now we're focused on what can be done in a lockdown. When the project was announced, we imagined 23 monitor deployments and at LAPL branches within and five months of data at this point. In reality, there have been nine monitors placed with Give us just a second, folks. I think we had a small cutoff in our video feed. I'll see if I can restart it from that same position and get the rest of that fantastic presentation. Library sites as relay points, environmental sensors will be permanently placed all over the city, sending back data regularly to the library and library members. This is a crucial part of the plan to build community, increase local knowledge, and amplify local leaders' voices. Libraries are uniquely suited to share, promote discussion, and, and um, provide analysis for air quality data. By recognizing the emotional and social components of looking at data as a community, librarians are speaking to the core motivations of participating based on personal and community achievement. So how's it been going? COVID-19. This is when community trust in public institutions is most tested. Now we're focused on what can be done in a lockdown. When the project was announced, we imagined 23 monitor deployments and at LAPL branches within and five months of data at this point. In reality, there have been nine monitors placed with volunteers and two at schools. The previous image was actually taken from a school in Los Angeles, Koreatown. But there's an opportunity. Monitors are recording the best air quality in years. We're taking this time to look at data use and data visualization design. Crisis highlights where public institutions are working and where they are not. Community re relationships and trust in public institutions are being stress tested. And while good crisis communication is always critical, the gaps in public data show that trust is weaker when people don't have access to good baseline information. Our question now, can communities that are documenting their air quality help reimagine what air quality might look like after reopening? And how can SafeCast data be useful in that? I'm looking forward to discussing this with you in the Q&A. We want to officially extend an invitation. Volunteer with us. We believe more data is better and that people should have free access to reliable, trustworthy data about the world around them. We hope you agree. Thanks for spending this time with SafeCast. Thank you very much to Angela. Uh, apologies for the small cutoff for any of our attendees there as the video skipped ahead just a little bit to our next slide. Um, we will have that posted on the air sensors uh, website so you can see it in full uninterrupted if you'd like to in the future or if you thought you missed anything. I'd like to um, move ahead now um, to Harold Rickenbacker, who is with EDF Business. 
Clean Air and Innovation at the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, Dr. Rickenbacker is a manager. In his role, he focuses on developing and executing strategies to identify, test, and demonstrate the value of hyperlocal insights leading to communities to reduce greenhouse gas and air pollution emissions. Harold has worked closely with an interdisciplinary team at EDF to develop a how-to guide for hyperlocal air pollution monitoring. By engaging with stakeholders across many, sec many sectors, he also helps to manage domestic and international clean air projects. Through EDF's work in Houston, Oakland, and London, Harold has helped to catalyze and demonstrate the technologies, business models, and partnerships needed to accelerate action to reduce pollution and improve health outcomes. Uh, Dr. Rickerbacher, I Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Hal Rickenbacker. I work for the Environmental Defense Fund out of our Washington, D.C. office. And thanks again for the opportunity to present today at this virtual A6 meeting. I don't feel like I need to drill down too much on the statistics here uh, for this audience, as we all know the impact that air pollution has on public health. Uh, but just to put in context, we breathe on average about 11,000 liters of air per day. All right, so a lot of air in comparison to you know, how much we drink and how much we eat, uh, you know, the air we breathe has really an impact on our health and productivity. Right now, conventional air monitoring or air net sensor networks aren't evenly distributed across communities. On average, uh, there is a global mean distance of 137 miles per PM 2.5 monitor. Uh, and that number is even more um, sparse across low and middle income countries, but also in rural parts of the U.S. Uh, in addition to these monitors being spaced out several miles apart, they often aren't installed on buildings or they are installed on buildings uh, high above the air that people actually breathe. So again, may not be reflective of resuspension res trends or inhalation dose um, and, and makes it much harder to link to health and, and cancer risks and, and, and the like. Uh, but we at EDF like to call uh, hyperlocal mapping as a means of making that invisible visible. Uh, and when we use the term hyperlocal, we mean air pollution uh, at high spatial resolution, so uh, different concentrations every 30 to 60 meters, and also at high temporal resolution, so different hours, excuse me, different minutes and seconds rather than hourly or daily trends. Uh, unlike conventional monitoring, hyperlocal monitoring actually produces this block by block visibility, uh, which can pinpoint hot spots and really give local leaders the real time data to tailor uh, interventions and, and, and uh, policies uh, that clean the air in the communities they live. Now, when we think about hyperlocal mapping, there are a number of ways that these impacts or, or the data can be used to drive policy and action in your community. It could be investigation or enforcement, so things like factories and other stationary and legacy point sources. Uh, it could be used for emergency public health interventions. So when a lot of our networks are offline, when natural disasters, these kind of mobile and low cost sensing platforms can be used to collect data. Uh, wildfires, ozone action days, and, and the like, but also just looking at transportation infrastructure, right? So informing where we design uh, transportation projects or where we implement no idling restrictions or uh, in traffic rerouting in communities. The list really, really reads on, and what we do at EDF is really put emphasis on data to action. So it's not enough to have a one-off air pollution monitoring project that collects data, but that there should be some policy or clean air solution attached to the data. In cities across the globe, we're showing how hyperlocal insights can improve the microgrid networks and provide more accurate identification of, of hotspots. Our most recent work combines pollution measurements and meteorological data, better known as source apportionment, to pinpoint uh, elevated pollution in Salt Lake City, where our work in China actually is a mobile monitoring challenge where we include or uh, cities include low-cost sensors on drones 
taxis and commercial vehicles. Uh, so over the next half of the presentation, I'll spend the majority of the time just giving a glimpse, a uh, snapshot view of some of our various projects in Oakland, Houston, and London. In 2015, Environmental Defense Fund, we started working in the Oakland, California area. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with Oakland, it sits, uh, it's enclosed by three major freeways downwind of the Port of Oakland, experienced high truck volumes, and has a lot of industrial facilities nestled uh, in between and among residential homes. Uh, we started in, again in 2015 working closely with Google Street View cars that were equipped with reference grade air monitors to map several areas within the city, including West Oakland. Uh, the hyperlocal hyper data was able to highlight impact zones or areas where residents lived among elevated levels of black carbon. And this data was used again to develop emission and exposure reduction strategies that span it from truck management and electrification to improve land use zoning, permitting and creating greater buffers between both industrial areas and vulnerable populations. So, Again, there was nursing homes, uh, child care facilities, hospitals, and the like. Uh, the levels of air pollution were determined to be at, at as high as eight times higher within city block, right? So it, it almost an order of magnitude higher when the data came back. Uh, and this was important because it's reflective of actual exposure pathways and validates the community's lived experience. Uh, EDF approached the West Oakland Environment Indicators Project as a resident-led community-based organization to really move this work forward as a key and instrumental partner. Uh, they have an extensive history of carrying out their own research and have led policy and advocacy in West Oakland for years. Uh, their perspective really, again, spoke to the lived experience and were a key community liaison, as well as being policy experts and leading the charge on using the data to drive actions forward. Um, in 2016, we partnered with uh, local organization and research study led by UC Berkeley to deploy 100 stationary monitors in the same area that measure black carbon. And ultimately, this study was, uh, we were able to overlay that data with health records from Kaiser Permanente, and, and it showed that elderly residents were at a 40% greater risk of cardiovascular disease as a result of being exposed to higher or high values of NO2. Uh, you know, long term, the West Oakland Environment and Indicators Project was very instrumental and they ended up being one of the first Bay Area communities to develop a community action air plan under California's new air quality management legislation, AB 617. Uh, so again, just speaks on the importance of those data to action pathways and here's a clear example of a community group leading that charge. Uh, Houston, uh, for those who may not know, is known for its massive petrochemical facilities less than 50 miles away from the Gulf of Mexico, which means it's kind of a prime area uh, to be impacted by hurricanes. Those two factors actually collided in September of 2017, where Hurricane Harvey devastated portions of the Texas coast. Uh, city leaders and public health officials identified elevated levels of benzene after Hurricane Harvey. Uh, from damages to one of the region's largest petrochemical facilities. And what's interesting and what's unique here is most of those industrial facilities uh, were unprepared for the storm, but additionally, a lot of their reporting was offline because of lack of electricity and so forth and so on. Uh, we were able to use mobile sensing platforms to really do these hotspot testing and monitoring and, and respond to complaints from residents of different odors in this community. Um, Two independent sets of benzene measurements were taken and discovered concentration exceeding 300 parts per billion. Uh, in conclusion, it was uh, close to six significant benzene plumes identified near this uh, refinery, which uh, was above kind of that fence line standard. Uh, based on increased media coverage, the One Breath Partnership in Houston, and a lot of on the ground advocacy and work from the uh, EDF and other or local organizations, uh, the city of Houston actually was able to receive the disaster planning funds to acquire and deploy permanent mobile monitoring platforms. Um, and the city has worked to coordinate efforts to develop a decision tree based on toxicity data. Building on our work in the U.S., EDF, along with the mayor of London and other leading health and science experts launched Brief London, one of the more robust and ambitious projects across the world. Uh, well, you may ask why London? Well, they had a well-established, you know, reference grade monitoring network, as well as pollution modeling in place. 
but also proactive leadership. And I want to stress that because a, a challenge often for policymakers is that there's no one single solution that can solve the air pollution problem and no one single department in cities that has all the necessary levers, right? So air quality investments should be driven by potential or realized cost savings and co-benefits rather than by political pressure alone. The initiative has three major components, a network of 100 air sensor pods deployed throughout London to complement the existing network. Also, the, these pods were, were placed to fill gaps in the existing network. Uh, they were insured a minimum of one AQ pod per borough in London and also focused on schools and other sensitive receptors for locations. The accuracy of the Brie London sensors and network was determined by co-location with conventional monitors and comparison with others within that network and measured for NO2, NOPM, CO2, and in some locations, ozone. Uh, the second component was measuring air pollution using uh, two Google Street View cars, which served as mobile platforms. And this was further linked with a study led by King's College deploying wearable sensors at several schools. But it's not just enough to have data, but to digest that data, right? So people need better information on pollution health effects as well as readily available and understandable air pollution data and analysis. Uh, Breathe London launched a website to serve as a new public platform for easily understanding air quality information. Uh, this included interactive maps that display current air pollution and past pollution events. And again, really the aim and goal here was to not only test a low cost network, but can it be and can it provide reliable data that supplements or complements the current reference network. Providing this hybrid local data to the public in an open platform, easy access and straightforward form was essential. And from that, it really helped assess policies for uh, social apportionment and interventions, which I'll get to in a bit. The findings uh, show that air pollution was dangerously high across the city and nearly half of the sensor pods uh, were likely to exceed the UK's legal air pollution limits that year also measured uh, and, and found large, alarmingly high NO2 levels near various parking garages, which were actually located near residential areas that lacked networks or monitoring before Breed London was established. Uh, building on that, you know, operating from late 2018 through 2020, Breed London aimed to provide data analysis to support uh, the policies and policy evaluations and increased citizen engagement to date. With that being said, they established a ultra low emission zone, which essentially is a fee charged to the most polluting vehicles in central London. The money in the US was uh, is invested in transportation networks and improving air quality uh, in London. So again, investing in capital infrastructure investments to improve clean air. Uh, the sensors showed uh, in the US that it was successful in reducing dangerous emissions uh, and harmful impacts on climate and health. Uh, the monitoring in the U.S. Uh, roadside NO2 pollution was reduced by 36% in that zone, which is, is just great. Uh, a separate study or assessment done by Global London Authority showed that from March to September 2019, there was a large reduction in number of older, more polluting and non-compliant vehicles detected in the zone. They saw uh, on average a fewer 13,000 vehicles, which was down or a reduction of eight, uh, excuse me, 38%. Now, as this project pro progresses, we, we would hope or we aim that Breed London data can build uh, more public pressure for ambitious clean air policies at the city and national level. But we're also working with our partners to capture lessons learned and develop resources that can help other cities benefit from this project's funding, or excuse me, finding. With that, you know, I took a look at the attendees uh, that were registered for this virtual meeting, and I wanted to just provide more of a high level overview of some of our projects, rather than diving into some of the core science and data. I think it's just more beneficial for this meeting and convening to, to again, review some of our work and have any follow-up conversations one-on-one -on -one with different entities and folks involved on projects in our tune-in today. 
Uh, but with that being said, we launched a how-to guide that really dives into some of our hard-earned trial and error on this hyper-local work um, and, and is guides local leaders uh, for meaningful action. So take a second uh, to download and access this guide at the link attached here. And then on the left is outlined the different core areas that really speaks to the plus and minuses of using stationary versus mobile, how to co-own projects with community groups, and really talks about the detailed experts and roles of providers and on-the-ground technical support for moving these projects forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harold, um, for a great presentation as well. Um, I, for one, have seen some of those Google car studies. I think they're quite interesting. Um, next up is our uh, discussion Q&A. And that means we will bring each of the panelists in. I have uh, tabled a few of the questions from the chat. You can keep putting them in now in both chat and Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, but I will start with asking a couple of the questions that were direct to specific presenters um, in the order of presentation. And then a few questions actually superseded each presenter and might be great to have their input from each one of them. Um, and I'll head to that one second. So first, uh, Graham, uh, we had a good broad question to get started, which is, uh, can any of your sensors be used for more than just public awareness? And kind of attached to that, is your download tool uh, available to just anyone? Yeah, so I guess I'll answer the second question first. And the download tool and the community reporter are currently publicly available at this time. However, we hope to make them publicly available in the near future. Um, in terms of what the sensors can be used for, you know, there's a framework that was developed by the EPA that's in their air sensors guidebook and they have a number of tiers um, and sort of accuracy and pre precision requirements to fit a sensor within that tier. And the purple air is they actually perform pretty well if they're properly calibrated. You might compare them to, you know, a reference nephilometer, which is basically a much more expensive version of the purple air um, used by some air agencies. And, you know, I, I've taken a look at that and they seem to perform definitely within the bounds of educational use and possibly even useful for supplemental monitoring, sort of filling in gaps in regulatory networks and helping to give us an idea, for example, if we're forecasting, if a wildfire is coming in, we can see that one minute data. We have a lot more sensors, so we know that it's coming from this direction or right here, right there. Uh, they can't really be used for you know, enforcement, compliance, or regulatory action, but there is some power in having communities being able to put up these sensors and come to government agencies with data that they've collected that highlights, you know, their concerns. Great, thank you for that. Um, one question we got was, are the purple air sensors all cited or deployed by your agency or do you also include perhaps any publicly cited citizen sensors as well? Yeah, so that map includes all sensors within our area. Uh, including citizen science, people, just individuals who purchase them, other groups. We have deployed about a dozen purple air sensors ourselves, and we have loaned out about that many to people in the region as well. And, you know, we've used them for short-term studies, trying to look at what's happening in a specific area, um, as well as trying to just get more information about how they perform by citing them with our regulatory monitors. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask Angela a couple of questions now from your presentation. Um, the first one we got was, what components are you measuring with your air sensors? We're um, measuring only particulate matter, so PM 1, 2.5, and 10. Um, and then uh, also shortly thereafter was, um, what kind of air monitors were you using? For instance, were they custom or did you happen to find one that's publicly available? So these are um, built, uh, the monitors uh, are built by SafeCast volunteers or were kind of conceived of and developed by SafeCast volunteers 
using components that are publicly available. We're using right now the Plant Tower 7000 series um, and the solar cast that we were talking about in the 2016 17 deployments. Uh, those were, uh, we were testing Plant Tower 5000 series against the uh, AlphaSense. So we were trying to see what sensors worked best and reliability and how they, how they work together, how they could, how they could uh, reference each other. Great. Um, now, I do have a, a, a type of a broader question here. How do you ensure that you can trust your own data was asked? Is there a process for that in terms of your calibration and verification, especially since you're making your own types of sensors? Well, I mean, our sensors are not different from commercially available sensors. They're uh, produced. Um, they're produced in small batches. Uh, as opposed to say our radiation kit sensors that are sold and put together by individuals, the air quality monitors that, that um, are uploading data onto the site are using um, standardized equipment. So, and, and they're put together you know, in, in groups. Uh, so uh, once people have them, they can cite them anywhere that they like and then they can turn them on and they automatically upload data. So I think there was a question about, you know, uh, people without training being able to do that. Well, they're able to do that because they're because it's it's a you know drop and drop and go sort of situation. Yeah. Uh, to follow up on that, I think that one of the questions about um, kind of enlisting volunteer help. How do you um, ensure standardized data quality in a project like Safecast? Um, well. With, like I said, if you're, it's not the person that is actually collecting, actually what's, what's really important for SafeCast is that you're participating in the collection and you're participating in the, in the monitoring, in the, in the looking and reviewing at the data. So really your participation in collecting the data is citing it, hosting a monitor, and then making sure that you know it doesn't have spiders crawling into the the um, uh, system, or that it's uh, if if it looks like the data is uh, starting to be a little out of whack with other sensors in the area, that you would check it and make sure that it it is clean and things like that. But we, it's a way of making sure that non-technical people can interact with the the actual machine, but. What's important is the data coming from the machine that they interact with the data coming from the machine. Thank you. Um, we had a question uh, from Tiffany. Uh, for the SafeCast AQ monitoring in 2020 at public libraries, how were you able to obtain city permission to place the monitors at the library? And was there any pushback? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what we did is uh, we worked with a with the Los Angeles Public Library and uh, found a grant to apply for that would uh, look at hosting the the monitors at in at the individual branches that we talked about the 23 branches and then also SafeCast will be uh, working with libraries to train the librarians which will then host the community groups inside those branches so really it's uh, SafeCast support is in um, helping average people be able to look at, work with, and use the data, not just um, understand it as happening in their environment. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to ask Harold a couple of questions before we get a chance to ask uh, a question for the entire panel. Um, I have one from uh, Tiffany as well. Uh, have you seen a community drive one of the data action pathways that you listed? Are there documented examples where we could look to better understand what motivated the community and what steps were taken in order to effectively advocate for policy change? Um, that might be kind of a question for that great guide you produced. Have you seen anybody use it successfully? Absolutely. Thanks for that question, Tiffany. Uh, you know, I think the community lens is one that's, that's very important. Uh, we, we first started talking about the importance of the monitoring networks and the grade of sensors, right? So if you're talking low cost, sensor grade, 
more for public awareness and then your FEM, FRM, more for regulatory and compliance, you know, starting that initial conversation with city leaders was or, or cities and communities was very important for us to identify what their goals were. So, you know, I feel like as large organizations, oftentimes we work with different community groups or when we apply for the NSF grant, NIH grant, we come with our predefined goals and objectives and reach out to communities to see if they want to be partners. But we try and kind of do an inverse of that, you know, starting with the primarily a needs assessment in communities to get an idea of what information is most pertinent to their quality of life, right? Um, and moving from that, essentially doing things like amenity mapping, disamenity mapping, to look to see what allies and resources are in the community. Because it, ideally what you don't want to do is to develop a project where you know, you end up having to be the technical arm, uh, on the ground support. What you want to do is develop different resources that you can leave behind and support different communities and organizations, right? So if those are modules, different infographics, presentations, and the like that can support these different communities. So that's a lot of what we did in some of our work in West Oakland. I actually have a training later today with some data to action groups in Houston where we're starting at square one. Uh, they've developed their community action plans, and over the course of the next six months, we'll be putting that into 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 action under the context of COVID and everything that's going on. It's been very difficult, but I think one thing, if, I, if I've said a lot, I just want to conclude on being responsive to the needs of the actual community and, and using that to guide those data to action pathways. So the work in Oakland around the ports was clearly linked to uh, addresses, clearly linked to homes and schools and churches that were impacted by the pollution, and we used that to drive our decision-making in the program plan itself. Yeah, thank you. I really like um, that you added that. We, we talk about sensors and, and people who like to participate in the projects. And the people come with their own stories too, which, which, which is why they'd like to participate in, in research. Uh, Brian Stacy has a question about the Breathe London network. He thinks it's very interesting. Um, one is the interesting use of CO2 measurements to assess changing emission indices. CO2 is not traditionally an air pollutant, climate change gas, do you see hyperlocal CO2 monitoring becoming more common in the future? Thanks for that, for that question, Brian. Uh, you know, I think our inclinations when we, we approach these different projects with city leaders is you have to, it's in a sense, meet them where they are. You know, we're in the air pollution space, you know, terms like black carbon, particular matter, NOx, SOx, they resonate with us. Uh, but when we're really trying to have this climate discussion around resilience in communities, CO2 is one of those GHG emissions that really uh, is a way that we can have that active conversation with city leaders. Although they may not care as much about air pollution, if you, if you word it or if you identify these kind of co-benefits, then it, it makes a, a better stick and, and, and can support resiliency funding. I say all that to say, you know, we tested for NO2, you know, ozone, CO2, PM, fat carbon, the different pollutants in the Brie Running Network. Uh, we were really where we saw substantial reductions or in the NOx emissions and NO2 emissions, um, more specific, obviously, to uh, transportation sources and mobile sources. PM, we didn't see as, uh, I would say, a distinct reduction, um, obviously, because you have more impacting factors like background sources that may blow in or resuspension and coagulation from particles in that network. But CO2 was also a surrogate that we use as just a specific point of contact to really have that lead in and have that conversation actively with city leaders. And then we prime them later with NO2 and PM as, as some surrogate pollutants to include in that conversation. I mean, I, 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 could, I could see a benefit in CO2 being a, a tool, maybe long-term in hyperlocal monitoring, but as we think about just legacy source points and regions and looking at emissions inventories and how we can really zoom in on different chemicals, if it's VOCs or NOx emissions from vehicles, I think I want to kind of stick with some of those more criteria pollutants as, as surrogates for now. Thank you for that answer. All right, so we have only about two more minutes, so I'm going to ask one great question that has come up in a couple of different webinars like this, and it's about data provenance. Uh, specifically, if you learn that one sensor is failing or sitting next to a pollution source and corrupted data, how do you let other users know uh, that information about that sensor? In other words, what information are you collecting 
about your data? And then how are you disseminating it with people you'd like to share that information? Um, I'd like to start with Angela, if that's okay. Are you also collecting metadata and, and data provenance features? Well, uh, in, in answer to the, you know, what, what would it be like to show data from a pollution source? I mean, I think we're actually interested in that and having um, monitors take over time readings and not be uh, mobile. Um, you can really go deep with when pollution happens and how, how that's affecting areas. So I think those are interesting readings still. But in, in terms of finding uh, like hotspots, it would be better to actually have a mobile sensor to find hotspots, to go around and see what's going on in a neighborhood. And then a lot of times what we found is that um, people will use a mobile sensor like an air beam to, uh, to find what's going on in their neighborhood and then have those questions. And then they can determine where to put the long-term sensors that they wanna have in a community. So that actually, I, I think that there's a way that sensor types can work together in, in looking at that. And so I, I hope that kind of uh, comes a little bit to your provenance question in terms of um, how sensors start to deteriorate, I think we are looking at that and we're trying to figure out different ways to address that. And we know that, um, that it does happen. When we see it happening, we ask people to check the monitor first and to you know, either check is it powered per, you know, correctly and things like that. Um, I'll let some of the other people jump in too. Thank you, Angela. Graham, do you have any insights on David Providence? Sure, um, I will answer for the uh, sensor map and the uh, QC that's done on the purple air sensors. And um, basically a lot of that's done in the background. There are a number of flags that can be applied um, if there's a certain problem that's noticed by the QC algorithms. Currently that's not publicly available on the map. There've been, there's been a little bit of interest in that, but I could see I could see in, the, in terms of transparency that it would be important to have not only, you know, your raw data, but all the transformations that have happened to it and make that available. Um, great. Thank you very much. Well, right about now is a great time for us to uh, thank our presenters, Graham, Angela, and uh, very wonderful presentations. And I'd like to kick it over now to um, a colleague and friend of mine, Ethan McMahon, um, who will get started on the second half of our live series. Ethan, it's good to see you. Hi, glad to be here. Um, the next session that we're going to go over is actually with Purple Air, Adrian Dibwad, um, the founder of Purple Air. And I hope his uh, session is queued up. I'm just going to give a quick background about his about him with his bio. Um, the Purple Air organization itself was born in the fall of 2015 out of Adrian's curiosity surrounding air quality in the Salt Lake Valley community. So today, Purple Air's global network has grown to thousands of sensors measuring real-time air quality made accessible to the public via their interactive map. After discovering his passion for technology at a very young age, Adrian spent many years honing his skills in complex electronic repairs, surface mount assembly, and prototyping. This expertise, combined with two decades of experience in computer programming, network engineering, and software developed, development, enabled him to create Purple Air. So I'm gonna hand it off to you, Adrian. I don't know if you have a presentation and you're gonna to have to go off of mute, excellent. Yes, hi, Ethan. Um, thank you for the introduction. I don't have a presentation as such. I thought it would be more beneficial to uh, make us available to answer some questions that, that people might have. Um, I think um, you know that that introduction describes me quite well and Purple Air is a citizen science network of uh, low-cost air quality sensors that everyone can take part in. Great, so maybe what we'll do is just um, look at some of the questions that have been posed about Purple Air because some of the other um, presenters already mentioned it. Um, and, and I actually, let's see here. Um, 
maybe we'll ask you as kind of a supplier here of purple air sensors, as opposed to a, a user as the other presenters have been. Um, you know, one of the questions that people asked was, how do you calibrate your purple air sensors at the user end? Maybe you can describe what you do as a uh, provider on the provider end about calibrating purple air sensors. Right. So, um, you know, from the very beginning, when, when we first discovered the plan tower laser counters, uh, we had three of them running on the table at the same time, and they all agreed with each other. That was the first time that that had happened, that they agreed with each other, uh, that three devices in front of me. So I took that as a good sign, and we still use that principle to this day, in that when we make a batch of sensors, we put them all in the same test chamber, we expose them to some particulates, we watch their uh, curves, the performance, the output of them, and we make sure that they all agree with each other. Um, so that's the checks that we do. Um, then as far as the network goes, when they've been deployed, uh, we have two laser counters in each device for the purpose of data quality. So you, you can see if they agree with each other, then, then it's more likely that they're good. If they don't, you could have something like the spider or a fan failure or something like that that's making one of the laser counters uh, read weird. So it's very unlikely that something like that would happen in both channels at the same time. So that's why we have two channels in each sensor. Uh, it makes you able to trust the, the output much better. Then has, has been mentioned already uh, by another presenter is comparing sensors to others in the area. You can actually use good air days and bad air days to do somewhat of a calibration across the network where if you have good air across the whole valley and you have only one sensor reading strange, you know that there could be something wrong with that sensor or maybe someone's having a barbecue. So looking at the dots is a very good way of doing that calibration. Excellent. Um, related to that, um, um, I'm not quite seeing it in these questions here, but it's kind of uh, some in inferred questions about uh, correction factors and raw data. You know, so um, you mentioned that you have, you look at the sensors under different conditions, I guess temperature and relative humidity are the two, the two main um, uh, effectors to your to getting accurate readings about the particles themselves. Um, how do you, and there are correction factors that are out there, and how do you take, how do you help people take those into account, um, you know, in either like high temperature, high relative humidity situations, or low temperature, low, low relative humidity situations, how do you correct, correct, corrected or correctable data? Right, so um, some of the studies that have been done on the sensors do show a humidity effect at high humidities. We're talking about 90%, 80% type humidities, which is not all that common in, in the wild. Um, it's, you know, if you're on the coast, maybe you have that more often, but um, we're trying to work the idea of the correction factors on the website, for instance, is that different groups can create their different interpretation of what they think the data should be corrected um, by and we'll present that as a drop down in the correction factor um, section so that people can view the map with that filter. Um, we don't um, apply any filter across the map overall yet because we don't have a general formula that applies well to everywhere. Um, you know, humidity will make particles swell or uh, make them appear slightly larger or brighter. And so that has an effect on the laser counter optical reflection type of way of measuring them. And, um, you know, some studies, like I said, have shown that effect only at very high uh, levels. And so mostly it's not all that much of a, of a problem. Now, the biggest thing is the different types of particulates have different uh, properties. They have different densities. They're more reflective, less reflective. And so um, depending on the exact mixture of pollution that you might have in your area, our readings might be off because the density is not uh, the same or not, not standard. For instance, wildfire smoke has a density of, of about 1.5 grams per centimeter cubed. Gravel dust has a density of about 2.8. And so if you've got something that's more wildfire smoke or more gravel dust, you're going to get different output from these sensors when compared to federal equivalent methods like gravimetric, which actually physically weighs the particles. So you're really trying to compare something that's not really meant to be compared to each other the count or estimate of reflection of particles versus the actual physical weight of them. It's the density, which is the biggest unknown. Okay, um, just to 
we only have about, I don't know, two or three more minutes, but I'm just going to ask you to, to respond kind of quickly to these last few questions. One is a follow-up to what you just mentioned. Um, in previous um, ASIC presentations by EPA, people presented correction equations. Do you plan to use those in your website or, or what? Absolutely. If people want to submit us their corrections, we will put them on the website. We'll link to their page to describe what the reasons are and everything. So they uh, please share them with us. We'd be happy to get them. Great. Here's another one that a few people have mentioned. How do you deal with um, continued accuracy um, in the long term? This is a very good question. It's something that we are going to be looking more and more at through hopefully the help of partners like the EPA or other groups that are going to study the data and give us some insights. So, you know, we, we are not necessarily a team of scientists. We've, we're engineers who can create a network who can put the sensors out there and then we rely on the public and the scientists out there to help us to make sense of it and to, to uh, process the data next. Great. Another couple of questions, just again, pretty quick, quick answers here. Sure. And just as a note to all of the listeners, um, we plan to take all of your questions and um, post the questions and the answers on the basic website. So we only have limited time here. But Adrian, just a couple more here for you. Um, do you have any idea of what the range of a purple air monitor is? You know, people are looking at how to space these monitors um, without having gaps or how to show kind of representativeness of, of a single sensor or a network of sensors. What, what are your, right. what's a quick so, answer um, to that? Uh, the South Coast Air Quality Management District has told us that you don't really have to place them all that close together because they compare to each other so well, like between different models, different uh, sensors, it's, it's really good. So you don't have to have them close together. People choose to put them close together. And, and so, but there's, is there any, um, if you were to say, um, a kind of rule of thumb or, or a rule that people have used in practice about proximity? Any ideas there? No, because people say, you know what, uh, you got one around the corner from me, but I want one outside my front door. They believe that maybe they've got something going on there that's not around the corner. So uh, they choose to place them close together. But if you're doing a study where you're placing 20 of them, you don't have to put them close together necessarily, depending on the goal of your study. Great. All right, last question. And this one is about um, devices that, are, that, that can last longer because they have a more continuous or long-term um, power supply, and maybe data connection. Any ideas about uh, you know, adding that kind of functionality? Um, functionality in terms of, of sorry. Uh, in terms of um, uh, power life, maybe or something like that, or solar. And then second, in terms of uh, being able to transmit data. Um, again, not, not connected to something by a wire. All, both of these things would be something. Oh yes, separate. Um, mm -hmm. you know we get we get asked questions about solar powered or sort of freestanding devices or Wi-Fi cellular connections, for instance. Um, we don't have something yet that we can offer to people in terms of solar powered. We advise that you sort of find yourself a solar panel, 15 watt or so, with a 20 amp hour battery to power the thing. Um, you know, batteries shipping batteries is very difficult. And um, we, we don't want to try and just sell something that doesn't make sense or that doesn't work properly. Um, so we ask people to come up with their own solutions. Um, and then long term, um, you know, we will see, we'll reevaluate. Great. Well, that's going to wrap up our, our discussion with you for now. Thanks for packing a lot of information into a short period. And, and thank you. We're always open to answer questions. So I see there's some other questions that haven't been answered. Please email us. Um, you know, we'll, we'll try our best to answer them. And the drop down of the conversion factors is in the bottom left of the map. Excellent. Thanks. Feel free to post anything if you'd like there as well. For any of the presenters, you're, you're welcome to provide partial or complete answers now. So now we're going to move on to another, our last two presenters for the day. Um, the next one is um, Peter Peterson from the University of Cambridge. He has two master's degrees, one in physics and another in sensor technologies. And he's currently a PhD candidate in astrophysics. Um, through his, uh, his his education, he's gained expertise in remote sensing, embedded systems, and machine learning. Um, in his second master's for sensor technologies, he co-founded an initiative called Seneca, which works towards creating a global mobile air pollution sensor network. He has success 
implementing pilot studies with the Argentinian government and the UN, where this initiative has won several awards, including the University of Cambridge's Vice Chancellor's Research Impact and Engagement Award in 2019. So now we're going to play Peter's- Hi everyone. Recording. Hi everyone, very excited to be sharing Open Seneca's work today. We started in 2018 at the University of Cambridge. The Open Seneca initiative has deployed pilot citizen science networks of low cost air quality sensors in cities around the world. Here, we implemented a pilot scheme in the city of Buenos Aires to measure PM 2.5 through the medium of citizen science. Our goals were to test the feasibility of using a network of low cost sensors in the mobile setting, but also to further enable the individual, you and I, to know more about the quality of the air that we breathe. Our motivation is primarily driven by the current spatial distribution of reference stations. As shown here from OpenAQ's global map, the spatial distribution of reference stations monitoring PM2.5 is, is relatively poor. They're mostly concentrated in well-developed countries, leaving a large portion of low to middle income, income countries behind. The reason for this, as many of you know, are that reference stations are usually very expensive, very large, and require frequent maintenance. They each cost in the order of tens to hundreds of thousands of pounds, which many places cannot afford. The data from these stations are important as they encourage cities to improve their infrastructures such that they can meet WHO standards to reduce healthier cities. However, these stations do not tell the whole story. They're fixed to one location, which isn't necessarily representative of the city or of the individual. Equally, their temporal resolution, normally with a cadence of one hour, hide intrinsic information which may be valuable to know. For this project, we were very fortunate to be connected to the Canada UK Foundation, who allowed us to work with the, with the Argentine government to deploy a small mobile network for monitoring PM2.5 back in May 2019. Our sensing hardware, we designed a plug and play style PCB, the latest version pictured. It aims to be simple to build, yet versatile enough to be applied to any setting, to be modular and accessible to everyone, where we use off the shelf components. Our designs are open source and available from our public GitHub. At low volume, they cost around £25 a board. The brains of the device was the Black Pill, a very powerful Arduino-like board with a STM32 microprocessor, Sensorian SPS30 as our optical PM2.5 sensor, which was relatively new when we deployed in May 2019. We were very happy to know that it re recently received the MSET certification, which falls in line with what, with what we've experienced. This was used in conjunction with the SHT31 to record temperature and relative humidity, which was attached to the board with a ribbon cable. To geotag the data, which was collected, the GPS manufacturer Ublock kindly provided GPS modules which retail at a price around £20 a piece, though there are lower cost variants which they do offer. To store the data, we opted for a micro SD card as the failsafe. The intention, however, was to use the 2G network, though as we were deploying, Argentina was slowly switching off their 2G infrastructure, uh, so this option was not used. Bluetooth was similarly an option, but we hadn't developed a mobile application by that point. We had a large 10,000 milliamp hour power bank in each device, which allowed around 120 hours of continuous use. We didn't want the battery to be a limiting factor in this pilot. All the components were secured in a junction box with a 3D printed inlet and outlet for the PM2.5 and temperature and humidity sensors. This yielded a total price of less than £100 for the volume of 20 devices de delivered. For calibration and co-localization, we were very fortunate to be allowed access to the new reference station, which was located at the US Embassy in Buenos Aires where six of our sensors, which were, which were built by local students in educational workshops we hosted, spent their, their time overnight collecting data. The results we got back from that night were very promising and we were very pleased. Here we see PM2.5 in micrograms per cubic meter versus time for all our sensors and the reference station. The light blue line shows the mean raw output from all the sensors recording every five seconds, with the width of the line representing the standard deviation from the mean averaged over 30 seconds. As can be seen, the sensors were incredibly consistent with each other. The yellow points show the raw concentration values from the reference station for the hour and the red points from the sensors from the SPS30 sensors showing the bin values for the same period. The reference station used a fundamentally different way to measure PM2.5, so that's why we were very pleased to see a similar trend, with some unexplained devi points deviating. The most important thing, however, was that our sensors showed a very strong agreement with themselves, and thankfully the SPS 30s were factory calibrated, and this calibration behaved very well for the pollutant profile present in Buenos Aires. 
Taking a closer look between the six sensors that were by the reference station, labelled boxes, we can see the spread from the mean was minimal, and we were confident in saying that the sensors from factory calibration were cross-comparable in Buenos Aires. Our methodology for deployment followed three steps. Educational workshops, where we hosted two workshops at local universities with over 80 students, the workshops began with a one-hour lecture on air pollution and related health effects. This followed an introduction to the sensing method and sensor. The workshops then broke into groups of four and five, where the students built the sensors following a manual that we had constructed. The sensors were later co-located and calibrated, as mentioned previously. For the data collection, we collected over seven weeks. The sensors were placed on bikes, measuring every five seconds. We can now do one second. We had 20 chosen citizen scientists out of 70 applicants, and they were chosen based on the amount they of and the amount they cycled and where they cycled in Buenos Aires. The data was uploaded by our citizen scientists, our volunteers, onto an online interactive platform. Finally, we wanted to do evidence-based policy, and so the aggregated data that was processed was handed on over to local policymakers. Our online interactive platform allowed volunteers to view the data they had collected via color map overlays on Google Maps. They could zoom in and easily see how their exposure changed. Further to this, they could change the color scale to a standard range to allow cross comparison with different routes they had also collected. There was a default red green color map, but we also implemented a colorblind friendly color scale. They could similarly see a time series variant of the data they collected on our online platform. There were also a range of other features, such as the ability to plot multiple routes and to produce aggregated maps. And to comply with GDPR and the like, the only routes visible by, the, by an individual were the ones they had collected themselves. However, they were able to share their routes with friends if they wanted to. Prior to the distribution of sensors, they underwent a quality check to ensure they were all functioning as expected, which they were. We had 20 volunteers, pictured here, who did an excellent job of cycling over a period of seven weeks. Um, they cycled over 3,500 kilometers, which equated to around 15,000 minutes of cycling and 200,000 geotagged data points. Looking at the change of PM2.5 over the duration of the project, comparing the hourly mean medians with the volunteers' values in red and the US Embassy values in yellow, it ranged from, a, from around 0 to 70 micrograms per cubic meter for when our devices were active. Our sensors once again showed the same general trend as the reference station, and any large discrepancies were likely due to location biases. Note the lack of yellow in this plot. The reference station was under maintenance for a good portion of the time we were active, which somewhat pleased us as we were able to provide baseline values for the city of Buenos Aires when the station could not, for a fraction of the cost. Zooming in, we can see the similarity in the trend more clearly. Mind you, they won't be exactly the same given the sensors were not in the same location. Comparing directly, and this time only taking when three or more volunteers were active, we can see the general relationship between the reference station and our sensors. The deviation from the trend is likely derived from differences in location, but it nonetheless suggests that we were in good correlation with the reference station, but we were somewhat underestimating PM2.5. We didn't see a correlation with humidity, as seen with other sensors in the market, but this may be more due to the placement of the humidity sensor uh, in the box. From all the geotagged data, we were able to produce air pollution maps of the city. However, the method shown here of averaging data over an entire data set is fundamentally wrong. As you saw in the previous slide, the hourly means for the entire city can shift between between 0 and 70 micrograms per cubic meter. Therefore, in order to produce maps of meaning, one needs to remove this time varying baseline, as shown here. Removing the baseline reveals spatially dependent hotspots of pollution that were experienced by the network. This map was produced by the aggregation of all the collected data, removing the varying baseline over a fixed time period. We chose 15 minutes as the time period, as it was estimated that a cloud of pollution would pass through the city in about 30 minutes, given the average wind speed experience in Buenos Aires, and we wanted to sample at half that period. Then using the median or modal value in this period, seeing that PM2.5 followed a log normal distribution, we were, we were able to provide estimates of the baseline. Either median or modal showed very similar results. We can now build maps of the baseline removed data set, taking the average PM2.5 values within fixed quadrant sizes, 200 by 200 meters shown here. Red indicates uh, 30 micrograms per cubic meter above the baseline, and green, indicate, green indicates at or below the baseline. Zooming in in some areas that strongly exceed the baseline, shown in red, we can see it's possible to identify the sources, some of the sources of pollution by eye. For example, zooming in here, you can see that here the likely source was the petrol station and of course the busy road. Here another example, we can see a very small street that is very congested, so it suggests the pollution was settling in this region. 
So the conclusions to this deployment, Buenos Aires does indeed have good air, has a low overall pollution baseline around 10 micrograms, micrograms per cubic meter. We identified 20 or so quadrants which exceed the relative baseline by a significant margin. We can provide baseline values at any time of resolution provided there are enough users within reason. Enabled people to be aware of the exposure through our platform and we mapped a major, major city with 20 volunteers in around a month, which is an amazing accomplishment. Finally, data from mobile sensor networks are complex complementary to that of reference stations, and the expansion of these schemes offers a strong potential for monitoring air quality in urban areas. Final remarks. There is of great importance to make data actionable. The engagement of citizens in air quality monitoring has a great potential, and as Margaret Wheatley said, there is no power for change greater than a community discovering what it cares about. By learning about their personal exposure, citizens can not only learn of ways to reduce their own emissions, mitigate their exposure to pollutants, but also actively participate in the search of solutions to successfully inform policy. Many thanks to all our citizen scientists and supporting parties. Thank you very much for listening. And as a final note, I'd like to say that Open Seneca is very much open for collabor future collaborations on both the data science and hardware front. So please feel free to contact us. Thank you very much. Wow, that was interesting. Thanks. We're going to quickly um, roll into our last presentation. Again, these are all pre-recorded, as you know, but we're, we're looking at your questions and we'll have a question and answer session after this last presentation. So to just close out this session, uh, we have Orly Stanford. She's a graduate research assistant at the University of Washington. Um, she's a PhD um, student in the Department of Environmental and Occup Occupational Health Sciences. And her objective is to conduct environmental health research that contributes to disease prevention through partnerships with communities where the research addresses community priorities and can lead to practical action. She's particularly interested in working with tribes. Her current research focuses on indoor and outdoor air pollution, the use of low cost pollution sensors, and building collaborative research partners. Let's hear her session. Hi, I'm Orly Stamper. I'm a PhD student at University of Washington in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health. And today I'll be talking about developing a method for local health jurisdictions and schools in Washington to use low cost monitors for wildfire smoke preparedness. And I'm working on this project with Julie Fox from Washington Department of Health and two of my advisors at University of Washington, uh, Catherine Carr and Edmund Sito. So I think we all uh, know that wildfire smoke is anticipated to increase in frequency and severity and will be more likely to overlap with the school year. Um, while indoor environments do offer some protection from wildfire smoke, PM2.5 can still enter buildings. Um, so this is a concern for schools and local health jurisdictions and they're looking to state agencies for guidance on this issue. Um, so in Washington, the Department of Health convened a group called the Wildfire Smoke Impacts Advisory Group, and one of their aims was to develop school activity and closure guidance, which they did, and it was based on indoor PM2.5 concentrations. Um, but they acknowledged that we don't actually have a set protocol for assessing indoor PM2.5 in schools. And so that motivated uh, the advisory group to embark on a pilot study to start to address this issue. So one of the questions motivating the pilot study is how does PM2.5 concentration differ within a school during wildfire smoke or other high particulate matter periods? So what do we expect the concentrations in a portable to be the same as a classroom that's connected to a main building HVAC system or um, a gym or a library? Two other questions motivating the pilot study were, can low cost sensors be used by school and local health personnel to establish reliable estimates of indoor outdoor ratio? And can that ratio actually be a reliable indicator of infiltration? And this figure on the right is showing um, different ways that outdoor particles can enter indoor environments um, and also indoor particles can come from indoor sources.
So the main idea behind the pilot study was that um, if schools could estimate their indoor-outdoor ratio of PM2.5, and if that ratio was a reliable indicator of infiltration, um, they could take that number and multiply it by the reading of the closest regulatory monitor to the school to estimate indoor concentrations, or they could multiply it by um, an outdoor PM2.5 forecast to forecast um, indoor concentrations. So um, we acknowledge that there are a lot of questions associated with this approach, but the goal of this pilot study was just to establish a jumping off point somewhere to start. Um, so the advisory group worked with three local health jurisdictions who worked with five schools total to set up um, one stationary indoor sensor and one stationary outdoor sensor for one to two weeks. And those are actually purple air monitors. Um, and then they also did a walkthrough of the school. They spent five minutes, about five minutes per classroom or area of the school um, holding a portable dialysis monitor. For the analysis, um, they looked at the variation between different classrooms and areas in the school. They compared indoor and outdoor PM2.5 sensor readings. They compared the outdoor sensor to the closest regulatory monitor. And they, um, the advisory group got some preliminary feedback from the local health jurisdiction personnel they worked with. So here are some preliminary results. Um, this table is showing the maximum variability between areas at each school that participated in the pilot study. And the results shown are based on five one minute measurements um, in the different locations at each of the five schools. So um, the left column is showing the location with the highest PM2.5 concentration then the next column is showing the location with the lowest, and then the third column is showing the average fold difference. So for example, in school number one, um, the PM2.5 concentration in the portable classroom was five times higher than that found in the gym. So I thought these, um, these differences were meaningful, even though they are based on very few measurements. Um, in comparing the outdoor low-cost sensors with the closest regulatory monitors, they found that um, the sensor tracked really well with the monitor, but uh, overestimated PM2.5, particularly when the outdoor levels um, went above 20 micrograms per meter cubed. And then looking at um, the indoor-outdoor ratios for, for four schools, they range pretty widely. Um, which was somewhat surprising to me because they have very similar um, filtration levels, those four schools. So we had five overarching questions arising from the pilot study. Um, one is, does the low cost sensor data need to be calibrated or corrected to be useful in this context? And I will talk about that more in the next slide. The second is how does the indoor outdoor ratio vary over changing outdoor particulate matter? So if the idea is for schools to be able to do this testing during typical air quality and apply it to periods of wildfire smoke, um, is it safe to assume that the ratio found during typical air quality will be the same or similar to the ratio found during wildfire smoke? And then three, what's the impact of indoor generated particulate matter on the ratio? Um, four, how many measurements are necessary to reliably estimate variability between the classrooms? And then five, how can school and local health personnel use this data to make decisions about school activity and or filtration needs? So the preliminary feedback was that um, the schools were enthusiastic about this protocol and local health jurisdictions were enthusiastic about the protocol, but didn't actually feel comfortable using this data to make decisions. So I wanted to start by addressing some of the calibration issues. Um, so one, we would expect varying particulate matter composition between typical and wildfire periods, and that would impact the calibration models. Um, two, we would expect varying PM composition between indoor and outdoor air, especially if there are a lot of um, indoor sources of particulate matter. Three, we would expect to see varying temperature and humidity conditions between 
indoor and outdoor, and also between typical and wildfire smoke periods, um, which will impact sensor readings. And four, um, we might expect to see varying conditions and PM composition between the school area and the regulatory monitor location, especially if they're not very close to each other. Um, so I want to start addressing that second question, how does the indoor-outdoor ratio vary over changing outdoor particulate matter? And so I did that by um, looking at data that was associated with uh, a paper published by Pantelic Da and Lucina 2019. Um, so they collected indoor-outdoor data over periods of um, typical air quality and wildfire smoke in two buildings, one that was mechanically ventilated with a high level of filtration and the other naturally ventilated. So I plotted the indoor-outdoor ratio over the outdoor PM2.5 concentration. And um, for the mechanically ventilated building on the left with the blue dots, I found that the median ratio during typical air pollution was 0 0.01, but during wildfire smoke, it went up to 0 0.24. And then on the right with the green dots is a naturally ventilated building and I found the median ratio during typical air pollution was 0 0.39 um, but during wildfire smoke it was 0 0.65. So this suggests that it might not be a safe assumption um, that the ratio found during typical air quality could be applied to wildfire smoke. So that'd be something to look into more. I wanted to start looking at this question um, in data that we've collected as well, although it's really hard to compare this slide to the previous slide because we just didn't see um, very many hours of high particulate matter. So I just compared um, the indoor-outdoor ratio um, when the outdoor PM2.5 was lower than 20 micrograms per meter cubed versus higher than 20. Uh, so in the, the school, the blue school shown on the left with the blue dots, um, I found that there wasn't a big difference between the ratio above or below 20 micrograms per meter cubed. Um, but in the purple school on the right with the purple dots, uh, the ratio actually went down for the, the higher outdoor PM. Um, but again, it's really hard to take a lot of meaning from this slide because we just didn't see very high PM levels. Um, so we have four main objectives for a follow-up study to build on the pilot study. So the first is to develop a recommendation for using walkthrough sampling to estimate variability between classrooms in the school. The second is to evaluate how indoor-outdoor testing done during typical outdoor particulate matter concentrations can inform infiltration during high particulate matter episodes. So the questions that I was just talking about. Um, the third is to develop an acceptable procedure for local health and school personnel to conduct to gain meaningful information on expected infiltration and variability within the school during high particulate matter periods. And lastly, our goal is to produce data that people are comfortable using to make decisions about school activity restrictions and air filtration needs. For the follow-up study, we're planning to collect um, long-term indoor-outdoor data at two schools um, in areas that we expect to be impacted by wildfire smoke. So we'll have two purple air monitors um, co-located outdoors at the school and then eight indoors in different classrooms and areas. Um, we're planning to collect data over about a six month period that includes the wildfire smoke season. Um, and to address some of those calibration issues that I raised, we are planning to co-locate all of the purple air monitors indoors and outdoors with gravimetric samplers for short term periods. And then we're also planning on using a particle size analyzer for short-term periods to get a better idea of particle size distribution because we think that'll play a big role in the changing um, indoor-outdoor ratio between typical air quality and wildfire smoke. To address the question of variation in indoor-outdoor particulate matter um, between rooms within a school, we're planning to compare the long-term stationary data that we collect from the purple air monitors to um, small samples of that stationary data, of that long-term data um, that represent 
hypothetical walkthroughs through the school with a handheld sensor. Um, and this figure is just showing a schematic of the school air sampling. The purple dots represent the purple air monitors in each of the different classrooms. Um, and then the blue dotted line represents a hypothetical walkthrough with a handheld sensor. And I'm obviously not an architect, sorry. Um, and then we also want to compare those findings of the variability between different rooms um, during typical air quality compared to uh, wildfire smoke to get an idea again of how testing done during typical air quality can be applied to wildfire smoke. We're also planning to have discussions with uh, school and local health personnel who are um, involved in this protocol to learn more about their ideas and experience. Um, so we'll be focusing on questions around feasibility, decision making, confidence in the data, data interpretation, and implementing changes. Um, and we're planning to, based on our findings, develop multiple different protocols that schools could potentially use. Um, we, we will update those protocols based on the feedback that we receive and then test them in two additional schools and then we'll further refine based on additional feedback um, with the end result being two different protocols that are informed by the direct experience of four schools and feedback from the advisory. So I just want to emphasize again this is a work in progress. I definitely welcome your questions and feedback. Um, please feel free to email me any questions or comments. My uh, email is here ostamp at uw.edu and thank you so much for listening today. Wow. Thank you, Orly, for um, this fascinating presentation. Um, I think it's really relevant to a lot of people in the world since so many of us are indoors more than we were before. And it's you know, a lot of the world is indoors right now. So these kinds of approaches are going to be really helpful for a lot of reasons. But now we have um, just another 10 to 13 minutes of questions for these last two presenters, we'd like to focus there. So any questions for Peter Peterson and for all the Stanford, please put them in the chat box and I'll look at the ones that have already been submitted and pose those questions. So for Peter, there are lots of questions about the, um, the bike data and um, some of the factors you might've run into, for instance, um, biking speed or the inlet and how it, the air in that, how it was designed in order to um, come up with consistent, uh, fewer variables as you collect that data. Let's start there. So with the cycling speed, um, the cycling inlet. Speed. Yes. Yeah, so the inlet design uh, was designed so it was collect air perpendicular to the direction of motion. And we had tested different designs and the one that was deployed in Buenos Aires um, worked very well and we saw no correlation with speed because um, these sensors are fundamentally based on the amount of air that goes in and the rate that it goes in and so it was really important to ensure that speed didn't cause any uh, any effect and thankfully it didn't within the the realms of within the realms of cycling so that super. was right super um, similarly what about um, the time of day the data were collected on like during rush hour during higher temperature, other so things like that? The cyclists, they cycle throughout all hours of the day. And when we plotted the, the average exposure uh, throughout the network through, over different times, yes, you would naturally see uh, spikes at like um, the rush hours. And at night, when for uh, atmospheric reasons, when you would have more PM at night. Um, but given the way that we produce the maps uh, from the baseline removal, uh, like rush hour periods were naturally kind of filtered out, except regions which were in naturally very dense in pollution. And that would be very much shown in the maps, as was shown in the second example, uh, when I said there was a very con congested street and it was likely being settled in that region because it was a very small uh, junction. Mm -hmm. um, someone commented that they thought that um, as the cyclists were collecting data, um, that you would see more hotspots 
maybe as you approached um, higher traffic roads or just more density. Um, and they were surprised that you didn't that the maps didn't show more hotspots. Any, any yeah. Any so the data we there? showed mm -hmm. was for the entire time period, just to show kind of hotspots that were consistent throughout the entire month. Um, if we were to splice the data into hours of the day, then I think we would, we would naturally see hotspots arising from uh, traffic or other factors. But we haven't. We, I didn't show that today. I see. I see. That, that's helpful to know. Then <clears throat> just a different. Uh, you can portray present the information using different um, different variables. One, one last one for now for you, Peter is. Um, how can you? How are you trying to harmonize measurements between different sensor types? <clears throat> you so we've experimented. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we've ex experimented with a bunch of different sensors, and so we began with the Novatec sensor, which I think was pop quite popularly used uh, and is still used today. And we were content with it until uh, we realised that as soon as you got any light near the inlet, it would introduce a spike to the data, and. Uh, of course, we didn't want like a, a very sunny day to be suddenly mistaken to be very high pollution, so we just dis disregarded that sensor. Um, then we tried the plant tower ones, and they were fine. Um, but the problem was that the documentation was a bit sparse, and at the time when we were uh, starting designing the Buenos Aires project, the Sensorian sensor was on the market and their data sheet was very comprehensible and it seemed to be very much in line with what we were looking for. And on top of that, the factory calibration was really beneficial and as shown that really helped us. Um, <clears throat> all right, so I know I have some questions for Orly. Um, I think of these as um, a lot of questions related to the indoor environment, <clears throat> like um, how how do you think ceiling height affects indoor air quality? Um, did you look at human traffic within the sensor range, and um, any other kind of different ways of measuring and other factors that you take into account that we haven't really discussed as much for all of these other participants who are looking outdoors. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so I think there are a lot of factors that um, can impact the indoor-outdoor ratio. And in the in the pilot study, um, it was just five schools for a couple weeks, so we didn't look at um, those factors. I did take a quick look at, um, I was curious about the variability between different classrooms and if, you know, the ones that showed much lower levels, um, you know, had no students in those in those rooms at that time versus the ones that showed higher levels and there wasn't actually a clear distinction that I saw there but um yeah for for looking at things like building age and different HVAC systems and filtration and um that people have brought up I think to do that you'd probably need a much larger study that compares a lot of different um, building types for this I'm really interested in kind of taking a deep dive at seeing how the low cost sensors perform and what what meaning can come from looking at um, the indoor outdoor ratio at, at two schools specifically. So I don't think I'll be able to answer those kinds of questions um, with the study, but I think that they're really important and I definitely need to look into those factors more to interpret the indoor outdoor ratios. All right, <clears throat> I a couple more questions for you um, that are not just about the kind of inputs, but also now about the analysis and, and another question later about kind of action. So on the analysis side, uh, what are your thoughts on the wide variability of input-output uh, ratios? I'm sorry, indoor-outdoor ratios at uh, very low outdoor PM concentrations? Because on the graphs, it looks like the ratios span the full range of zero to one. And it's, how to interpret, what, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, so I think um, a big part of that is when the outdoor ratio, when the outdoor levels are really low, I think that um, the ratios look artificially high. So I think that's part of it. 
Um, and so I've been wondering what to do about that. Like if I should have a, a threshold, you know, I just don't look at data when the outdoor uh, PM 2.5 levels are too low. And then I think another impact is indoor generated sources of particulate matter. So students moving around and kicking up dust from the carpet or um, maybe some combustion coming from a cafeteria or something like that, or, you know, printers. Um, there's a lot of potential indoor sources of particulate matter too. But I think that, that the artificial, artificially high ratios at, at those really low concentrations are um, also making a big difference. Thanks. Um, now here's another, here's a question that relates kind of again to your input, what I see as kind of inputs in, as well as analysis. And that is, do you have feedback from teachers and students on where they smell wood smoke inside the school during events? You know, our noses are, are very sensitive and can, can detect things at very low concentrations. And um, the concentrations would vary even within different rooms of the school and on different sides of the building and so on. Any ideas about using um, human sensory techniques or data to correlate or, or otherwise interpret your information? I think that's a great idea. Um, right now we don't have plans to do that, but I'm really open to um, working with the school personnel and seeing if there's interest in that kind of thing. I'm trying to balance, um, you know, interesting, useful work with burden on teachers and students. Um, but if they were interested, I think that would be a really great thing to look at. Um, I guess I can just provide one example of getting feedback. It's not from teachers and students, but we had one um, custodian in the pilot study who mentioned that whenever they change out the filters on the north side of the building, they notice that the filters are dirtier compared to the south side of the building. And so that would be an example of something um, we would take into account for interpretation. So many variables, and it's really hard to do these um, experiments, so to speak, with, with having fewer variables at a time and with a smaller sample size. So it's really, your, sample, your, um, your experiment design is really uh, critical here. Um, regarding kind of putting the data into action, someone asked if you've explored the effectiveness of using vegetative buffers around schools and the impact of that. Is that something you took into account? No, it's not, um, but that's a really interesting idea. And I, I've heard of that before, but I didn't think about it for this project. So I, um, I'll look into that. Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of, the kind of thing that you maybe can figure out um, post experiment, you know, even if you didn't set it up that way, you can use the observational in information you just had, like about which sides of the building might have more, um, more particulates. Um, you, you can do that post facto maybe, just kind of qualitatively. I'm looking ahead, looking back at some other questions that might be cross-cutting. Um, yes, I'm just thinking of um, just looking through these many, many questions we received. We thank you for all these questions. This has been um, just spectacular for us. We hope you're finding ways to um, learning about this whole topic area from our, our participants. I'm going to look quickly at the questions and latest questions in the chat, but um, it looks like we've, we've kind of crowdsourced some of these answers as well. Um, I think actually this is a good point, even though we haven't, all right, yeah, one last question for Peter about what your next steps are on research, and then we'll just do a quick wrap before going over time, so we don't go over time. Just quickly, Peter, next steps on your research. Um, so we're intending to expand to other cities around the world. We have a few pilots going on in other areas in Latin America and Africa. Um, so as in, our main aim is to enable people and to make sure that the data that comes out of these pilots has an impact on policy and on the people. Short to enable kind of behavioral changes to improve the quality of the air that people breathe. But in terms of research, uh, we're we're actively looking into different ways of analyzing the data and also looking at ways to improve the hardware to make it more user-friendly. Yes, great. I don't know, Sandra, if you want to wrap this up and um, close this out. Um, what I'm gonna do is just put the URL for <clears throat> the page where people can get these recordings <clears throat> in the chat.
Sandra, anything you want to say? Yes, great. Um, thank you for doing that, Ethan. I wanted to give a thank you to all of our attendees for joining us on this virtual platform. And of course, a thank you to Calvin and Ethan for being our moderators. Um, the presentations went very well, so thank you for sending those in and to all the attendees for asking a lot of questions, so many questions. It's great to see. Um, as uh, Ethan and Calvin have said, we will share these questions with the presenters and hopefully they will be able to answer them um, and we'll put the answers on our website. So other than that, I hope you have a great rest of your day and we will see you online for another event. Thank you very much.